In this video, I'll demonstrate how to access eLearning, the learning management system for Cairn University. You can log in with your username or your email address and your system password. So once you log into eLearning, on the top left here, you'll see this little icon next to the logo. And this is where you can control this panel on the left. If you want to see the panel all the time, you click on it and it will display similar to this. And if you want to hide this panel, you can just simply click on that same icon again and it will park it on the left. The same functionality is still available, but just a, a more real estate for you to do your work. The other thing here on the right hand side, we also have this, these blocks and this can be controlled from this icon right here. So I'm going to leave this currently enabled as well as the panel on the left. Now the dashboard can be customized further to your liking. And typically by default you're going to see the course overview and this is filtering or giving you a list of all the courses that you have access in e-learning. This would mean the prior courses from prior years plus any future courses and the current ones. And if you scroll down here you'll see many of them depending on what you have access. Additionally, further down here, you have this recently uh, accessed courses, and this is a listing of the courses that you have accessed just recently, just like the word says recently there. Now, you can control what displays here on the front page by clicking on the drop down here under all, and you could say, I want only those in progress. At this point also it's important to note that the course is in progress or what shows up under in progress it's basically uh, related to the start and end date for the course so and that is typically controlled by going if I go here to the actual course click on the gear icon I choose edit settings and then under the dates right here for the start date and the end date it has to be, uh, so today's date or what you need there is for these dates to be in the future. So basically this will expire in June or it will be ending up in June 2019 and after that it will be listed under past courses. So if it shows in the past courses but you want it to still be listed in the current courses, you need to change the dates on the course itself, the start and end date. Keep in mind that when you do this, though, it's going to change it for your students as well. So now let's go back to the dashboard. You can change it here to in progress. And notice for specific courses here, you also have these three dots next to the title of the course. That means that you can put a star to specific courses that you want or you can hide specific courses as well from your view. Now, if you hide something, you're not going to be able to see it under the courses in progress. So in that case, to view hidden courses, then you have to go here under in progress and then choose to show hidden courses and then that specific one that we just hit is going to be listed in there. Or if you choose all courses, then it will be listed again under all the courses and it will show up in there. And if I choose hidden here and I want to unhide it, just go back to these three dots and choose to show the course and then that will be listed under the in progress courses. So that's basically the filtering here that you can control what you want to see, whether you want to see the past courses, the future courses, or the current courses and such. Now, if you put a star to many of the courses that you want, then you can also change the filter so you can see only those courses that you have put the stars on or you can have marked with a star. And that's another way for you to customize the dashboard to list only those courses that you want. Now, if you have access to uh, uh, multiple courses, so if it's more than 12 here, you can change how many it can show up on the front page. So you can change it up to 48. And then once it goes beyond that, you're going to have multiple pages here. It's going to be listed on the right-hand side for multiple pages and such. Now, another thing that you can do to customize the course overview here is 
also how you want the courses to be sorted. So you could sort them by last accessed, and in that case, the most recently accessed courses will be listed first, or you can show them by course name as well. An additional feature here is that the card view, and the card view is basically the view that we currently have here. You have a little picture of that course, you have the title of it and the percent complete for that course. Now the percent complete, by the way, that is connected to the completion tracking within the course, and it's mostly useful for the students in that course. So for faculty, you probably don't have to worry that much about it's like per the percentage that you have completed for that for the activities in that course. Under the card here, you can change the view to just give you a listing of all your courses. And this is a cleaner view in this case. Or you can change this to give you the summary list of the course. So in this case, it will give you the title of the course along with a description for your course. Now the description here, in case you are wondering, you can change that under course settings. If you go to the actual course and you choose edit settings for that course, there's going to be one of the fields in there for course description. So once you set those preferences to what you like and the view that you like it, then the dashboard it will stay the same. Personally, I prefer the card view in this case. Now notice also on the right hand side here under the uh, the panels on the right here are the blocks on the right. You'll also see a new block here, the timeline. The timeline typically uh, you can choose here how many items to list, but those would be items from the courses that the student is taking and activities that they have to complete. Now those are related or connected with due dates within the activities for them to show up in here. So if you choose to set the due dates, Within the activities, you must also make sure that they are up to date. However, the students find the due dates and such very helpful because it will show up in here in the timeline for them. And also for you as a faculty, it will show up for you to grade those activities as well. Note uh, you can also control here how to sort it by dates or to sort the timeline by courses as well. When you assign dates to various activities in the course, those dates also will trickle down to the calendar as well. Finally, there is also this option here under recently accessed courses. And again, this just has a listing of courses that most recently accessed. If you prefer to have this higher up here in the dashboard, you can click on customize this dashboard and then simply go down to that block, which is recently accessed courses. And then you can simply drag this up, just like you move activities in the course. Once you drag it up, you can click on Stop Customizing this page. And now the most recently accessed course list, it will be showing up on the top. And then you have this other stuff here right below it. So it's up to you how you choose to customize this to your liking. In this brief session, I'm going to go over the general components of a course in e-learning or in Moodle. And this is the blank shell of a brand new course with no content on it related to that specific course. Again, notice here on the left-hand side, you have the various menus for this particular course. So if you wanted to view the participants in the course, you'll just go right here under participants. And notice the various participants here. You notice you can also filter the participants here based on particular roles. If you want to see just the students or the teachers in that course and such, you can just simply choose the role and then those will be filtered automatically. To navigate the course, you can use those links right here on the top. And you basically, to go to the course home page, one of the options is to simply click here on the course name. 
If the course had multiple sections here, which means multiple one of those topics, they would show up here under the course section. So you'd have topic one, two, three, and such. And once we build it, then we are going to access those modules much simpler as well. Accessing the grades, this is the grade book for the course. And we'll get into the grade book later. And then to see all your courses and other components that we saw also on the dashboard, those will be here on the left. Now we're going to minimize this uh, menu here on the left hand side by clicking on this icon here to the left of the logo. Also on the right hand side, we are going to minimize those blocks as well as we can get started with working in the course. Now typically each course, each blank shell in the course, it includes 17 topics, assuming that the course will be between 15 and 16 weeks, and you have one extra here. Now here on the top right hand side, you also have this gear icon. This is where the magic happens for you to get started with the course. So you need to click on this gear icon, and this is where you can change the course settings. So if you go here under course settings, you can modify here. By the way, we do not recommend that you modify on your own the start dates and end dates here because it messes also with the students. But on your own here, you can put in the description for your course, and that's what will show up on the main course page. So here you can copy and paste this uh, from the syllabus and put it as the course summary. You can even include an image if you prefer by uploading the image in here and then uh, we suggest that you do not mess with the other settings here and just leave everything else alone and just choose save and display. So that's how you can change the course settings. Under the gear icon you have additional options here for backing up and importing the course and accessing the gradebook setup and course completion and such. But the most important component here is the turn editing on. This is the feature or the option that enables you to make changes to your course now that you're starting with it. Now once you click on turn editing on, notice that you have all kinds of new buttons that show up everywhere and that's what we'll go over in the next session. So stay tuned. In the previous session, I covered some of the general components here and the menus on the left and on the top and also on the bottom. But now we are going to get back into the actual components of this actual course and how we can modify it, add activities and such. Now, typically, as you're teaching your course, the idea is that you can post all the resources, whether it is a syllabus, contact information, lecture notes, assignments and assignment details, and quizzes and anything that you can think of about the course, post it on e-learning here. So now the actual components of the course at the very top here is where you would post your course name and such and the contact information. Right below it you have announcements and then those that say topic here, you have topic 1 through 16, those can be modified so they would be like units or it could be separate weeks or it could be however you want to divide your course and organize it for the rest of the semester and such. Now here's what a completed course looks like. So at the very top you have here the contact information, how to get started, the instructor also has a video here embedded in the course page, we have the announcements, course orientation, then we have everything organized by units. So unit one and everything related to unit one is organized in here. Notice it has a starting point. So you have the unit one definition, then the major topic that you're going to cover for that particular unit, and then the dates for that unit and also directions where to get started next. And then you have a listing of all the activities within this course. And we'll go on how to do this for each individual item as well in just a moment. Uh, so these would be various different activities. For example, that's a forum, that's a quiz, and uh, this is an actual assignment and such. 
Notice also in this case the instructor here has labeled each activity by a number and those numbers help in identifying issues. Whenever there is an issue the student can refer it to item 3.1 in the course rather than having to describe it and such. Plus it tells them how to proceed with the course activities. So the idea in the course in Moodle or in e-learning here is to organize everything in units where all the components are under a specific unit or that specific week and then all these units are arranged in a sequential order. Now for the student to access them obviously they can go here under the section numbers and jump to a specific section as well. So let's get back to our course here, the blank course that we were working on earlier and let's work on this. So the first thing that we need to do in the course is to make sure that editing is turned on in the course to modify anything in it. If you see all of these different buttons here or the green pencil and such and add the new activity and such, then editing has been turned on in the course. If for some reason editing has not been turned on in the course and you don't see those buttons to modify stuff, then you need to click on the gear icon and then click on the turn editing on option right here. So in this case you have those specific topics in here. So you have up to 17. You can name them however you want like we mentioned a moment ago. You can call them units and such and it will show you how to modify those as well. If you need more topics in here you can add them from down here where it says add topics and you can choose to add let's say three more or 40 more or whatever you want and then it's going to add however many you chose. If you want to delete any of those that you think you don't need, you can click on edit here to, at the topic level, edit, and then choose to delete that specific topic. Now let's learn how to modify the top of the course to give it a title and put your contact information and such. To modify the top of the course here, you can click on the edit icon for that specific section. So we want to modify this section here and we click on edit. If we wanted to modify section 2, then you click on edit over here and such. So we click on edit at the top level, click on edit section, and then we want to give it a custom name for this section. So we click on custom and then we say and whatever the course name is in that case. Then here under summary, that's where you can put any contact information. Put your email, telephone, and you might also want to include in there directions on how to get started. Notice here you have also this, um, these tools, very similar to a word processor, and if you hold the mouse on them, it will show what they do and such. So you can technically format this any way you want. Once you have entered the summary information here, then press Save Changes. And then the information at the top of the course now has been posted. Now this is live for the students for them to access it and such. Now if you needed to modify any of these other areas here, you'd click on let's say topic one and we want to modify that to unit one or week one, whatever you want. And then hit enter. Notice if you press escape or anything else other than enter, you're going to lose whatever you type in there. So you need to hit enter. And you can do the same thing for topic 2, 3, 4, and so on, and rename those. Now to add any components to the course here for each one of those areas or units or blocks, you'll need to click on add an activity or a resource, and these are all the various activities and resources that you can add to this platform and to this page or to this course. And we'll learn about most of those shortly here in the rest of the tutorial. 
So you'd be basically picking any of those and then clicking on add, and I'm going to cover those in detail just shortly. So stay tuned for the next session for uploading and posting the syllabus. In this session, we're going to learn how to upload the syllabus to the course page in eLearning. There are a couple ways to upload the syllabus, and I'll show you the harder one first, but this will always work with whatever browser you're using. So the first option is going to be to upload it by using the Upload a File option. So we're going to click here, assuming you have editing turned on in your course. If you don't, click on the gear icon here and choose Turn Editing On to make sure that you can edit and modify stuff in the course. Now at this point, we are going to add the syllabus manually by clicking on Add an Activity. And then we're going to scroll down here under the list of resources and activities. And we're going to choose here the File option. So we want to upload the syllabus as a PDF file. Then we're going to click on Add and then we can give it a name here. A description, there's no need to put a description. However, if you wanted to have a description in there and post this on the front page, you can do that by simply typing the content in there. And then this option, display description, it will present it and post it on the main course page. Then under select files, you can simply drag and drop the file in here, or you can navigate for the file by clicking on the add button here. And then you click on choose. We are choosing a file from our computer. And then we are going to browse for the syllabus file wherever we have it stored. So in this case, I have it here under eLearning working files. And then we're going to find the syllabus, which is this file right here. And then double click on it. We click on upload the file. So the process so far is very similar. You're navigating for the file, just like you attach a file to an email. You're navigating, you're selecting it, and then you're coming back here. And then you're clicking on save and return to the course. Notice there are additional settings here that you can check and see for yourself. But as you're beginning with this system, there's no need to mess with any of those settings at this point. Then we click on Save and Return to the Course. And at this point, the syllabus has been posted. And also, this is the description right under that item. I would suggest that as you use those descriptions, make sure you use them conservatively and you do not populate everything on the course to make it kind of too busy. Because the idea is, as you post a lot of those resources, it'll be concise and clean for the students as well. It's best actually to post the details within each activity after you have posted, let's say, Assignment 1, then you have all the details for that activity within the Assignment 1 item on the main course page. So that's one way to upload the syllabus. Now, if we click on it, it's going to download it, and then the student will be able to review it and such. The other way to upload a syllabus or files and such is by simply having the e-learning page open and also having editing turned on in the course. And then you can bring up your file manager or file explorer. And then you resize this window to be slightly smaller than the e-learning page. And then you can simply drag and drop the file that you want on the course page. And this process works exactly the same for lectures as well. So let's say for unit one, I needed to post this into a PowerPoint for that unit. I can simply select it, hold the mouse down, and then drag it to wherever you want it on the course page here. Now, once you have dragged that item and posted on the course page, remember you can also modify the title and such for it by simply clicking on Edit Title, and then give it whatever title you want. If you want to modify additional settings and such, then you can click on Edit here, 
and then you choose edit settings and that is the process for any of the items that you post in the system here if you wanted to replace this you can replace it under settings and such the easiest for you might be to simply delete it by clicking on edit here and choosing delete and then simply re-uploading that particular item that is assuming it's just a lecture or lecture notes but not an assignment where students have submitted work and such to upload more than one file in your course page you can simply do it the same way by going here to the file explorer to wherever you have your files and resizing this window similar to what we did earlier and then you're dragging those items and hold down the mouse you're actually selecting those items and you can select items multiple ways by either holding down the shift key or by holding down the control key and selecting one at a time or simply using the mouse here to drag stuff but you're going to select all the items that you want and then you're going to drag those to that specific unit as I mentioned earlier it's probably best to rename those activities so that they make sense and they are meaningful for the students also provide also numbers particularly for example this would be 1.1 that would be 1.2 and so on so that's how you upload the syllabus and that's how you upload additional lecture resources and notes and details or documents for your students in the course the next session I'm going to cover how to configure the gradebook because it's best to configure the gradebook next at the beginning of the course based on your syllabus and then start with the building of the rest of the course. So the great book is next, so stay tuned. In this session, we are going to learn how to configure the grade book in the course. It's best to configure the grade book early on in the course as you're starting to build it. You can also configure it later in the semester and such, but it's not advisable because then the grades will not be calculated correctly for your students. So as you start the course, configure the gradebook first, even though you may not find it very relevant at this stage. So the gradebook is typically based off the course syllabus. So if we go here to the syllabus and download it and open it up and such, one of the sections in the syllabus is going to be the demonstration of learning so you'll have most likely very similar to something like this where you'll have major categories of activities or work that students have to do for you that count for a percentage of the course grade for example in this case we have weekly quizzes and the weekly quizzes are going to be 30 percent then we have two comprehensive exams they're going to be 20 percent each then we have an e-portfolio, which will be 5%, homework assignments, 15%, and blogs, 15%. All of those will add up to 100%. So this stage, we need to basically tell the system or enter in the system those categories or those major areas for your course. Now to configure this in the course, we go back here to eLearning and then we go to grades here on the left hand side. So that's one option to get there. Or if you click on the gear icon, there is also the gradebook setup option in here as well. So we are going to go on the left because that's where most likely you'll find it the most common. You'll go on the left here on the grades. And notice you have an item here or one of the tabs is setup. So under setup, notice right now it has the course code and then the course total, but there is nothing else for this course entered yet. At this stage, the next thing that we need to do is add a category. Now before we add a category, I'll just explain 
as to how it kind of works. So by default, the courses are configured to use the weighted mean of grades. What that means is you'll have various categories in the course. Quizzes would be one of those categories that I was covering earlier. The exams, it's another category and such. Now those quizzes would have, for example, 30% of the course grade, but the exams could be 50% of the course grade. So there is a weight to each one of the categories or a separate weight. So we need to add those categories here. Like we saw earlier here in the syllabus, we have quizzes, then they are 30%. Then we have exams, they are 20%. So we go under the category and we type in their quizzes. And then under aggregation, this is where a lot of individuals get confused. The typical setting for the category level will be simple weighted mean of grades. Not weighted mean of grades because we are not weighting the actual quizzes. We are not giving different weights to each quiz. They're pretty much all equal. We just want the system to simply calculate them and give us the mean of grades or the average of those grades. So we have the category quizzes, simple weighted mean of grades. Again, not weighted, but just simple weighted. And then we leave that alone. If you wanted to drop any of the quizzes, so let's say you'll have 10 quizzes in the course and you want to drop the lowest one, this is where you can specify in the system that you want to drop the lowest one or two or however many, and the system will figure out who got the lowest grade across all the quizzes and drop that particular grade. And then we go back down here and choose Save Changes. So right now at this stage, we are simply entering the categories. So now we have the course here, we have the quizzes, and we have simple weighted mean of grades. Again, you would want to use simple weighted mean because this is where a lot of the faculty get stuck and frustrated at the same time. The next thing we need to do is we need to enter the next category. So here in the syllabus on the demonstration of learning, we had two comprehensive exams. So we'll call that exams and we choose add category, simple weighted mean, leave everything else alone, press save changes. Next, if we look in the syllabus, we had here ePortfolio, it's 5%. Even though it's just one item, it's best in this case to create a new category for that single item. So we call it ePortfolio. Simple. And then save changes. We go back to the syllabus. And then we had homework assignments. Those are 15%. Again, remember simple weighted mean of grades, save changes. And then notice we have a couple other things here as well, like the weekly technology blog and the PowerPoint presentation. For the sake of time, I'm going to just wrap those up into one and call it final projects or research projects might be a more common name. So add category. And in your case, you want to match it to the syllabus. You'd, you'd have that additional item. In my case, I'm just speeding up the video here so you get the idea. Then we click on the simple weighted mean of grades again and then press Save Changes. So now at this point, we just added all the categories based off our syllabus. But we have not assigned the weights yet. So we have quizzes, under and quizzes it was 30%. And then the exams were 20, the ePortfolio was 15, homework was 15, and such. So here, we just put 30 in there, not 0 0.30, but just 30. Here under exams, we said in the syllabus it was 20, so we put 20 in there, 
ePortfolio was 5%, we put 5, homework assignments was 15, and then research projects would be 30 in this case. So you want these numbers to add up to 100. Then we press Save Changes. Now notice you have quizzes, simple weighted mean of grades. I'm emphasizing that because it's important and this is again where many faculty get confused. And then you have exams, simple weighted mean of grades, and ePortfolio as well, homework assignments and such as well. Now if you have cases like for exams where you'll have three or four exams and one of the exams weighs more than the other exams in the course, that's when you can use weighted mean of grades. So you can change the calculation for that to not be simple weighted, but weighted mean of grades. That gives you an opportunity right below this category to say exam one it's 20%, exam two is 20%, and exam three is 60%. So there will be some the activities will show up right below this under the category here when you have the exams created in the system. Now to change it to a different type of aggregation, if you had to do that, you'd need to go here under edit for this specific category. So for example, exams category, we click on edit, choose edit settings, and then change the aggregation right here to weighted mean of grades. Now once you have entered those percentages, of course make sure that you save the changes in the course page. Since we are in the grade book, just one other important thing here as well would be to look here under the letters tab and make sure that the letters match with what you have in the syllabus. So for example here anything above 93 percent it will be a letter A for both any of the activities in the course and for the course final grade as well. Anything between 90 and 93, it will be an A minus. So you want to make sure that this scale here matches your syllabus. If you need to modify the scale here, make sure you're under the letters tab and you click here on edit or edit letter grades or grade letters here and you can override those defaults by using those percentages here. And then once you're done, simply press Save Changes. So this is how you set up the gradebook in the course. It's advisable that you do that in the beginning of the course as you're setting up the course and such. Now to typically view the grades, you'd click on the View tab and then you'll be able to see the grades for your students here. In this case, we do not really have any grades because we are simply starting with this course and nobody has submitted any assignments. In this session, we are going to learn how to add links to YouTube and links to articles in your course and embed them in your course as well. So we are still working on adding resources. So as we get to this point of adding more components, remember here that under Add an Activity, you can choose to add the various activities, and these are graded things. But then you have also resources, so you can add a book or files or a folder or a label or a page and things of that nature, or a URL to something. So the resources are not graded, they are just resources for the students, but then the activities are things that can be graded and the students have to complete them and such. So let's first learn how to add a URL, like a link to an article. So let's suppose we are going here to uh, the library system, so it's uh, library.karen.edu, and we start our search here, let's say competency-based education and uh, search one of the databases and we'll find one of the articles. By the way, try and explore this. We invest quite a bit in those resources, so try to incorporate those resources in your courses and such. Now here we have a PDF article. 
So you're going to browse here. You can filter those resources and such and all that type of thing. But then you find, let's say, the article that you want. Then click on the PDF link to it here. And this is going to give us the actual link to that article. So once you have the link to the article, this could be on a web page and such, then typically you'd copy the URL from up here. Now, since this is a library database and such, you'll have to do this slightly different than copying the URL. So if it were a regular website, yes, you'd copy it from the top. If for articles from the library, you'd look for this linking icon here, the permalink. And then you're going to copy that by right clicking on it and choosing copy or however you copy stuff. So in a PC, it'll be control C. And then we're going to go back to our course here and we're going to add a link to this article. We'll click on add an activity or a resource. We'll scroll down to URL and then we'll click on add. And then we're going to give it a name. Then post the URL in there, control V, like Victor for Windows, or right click on it and choose paste there as well. You could put a description if necessary, and then click on save and return to the course. At this point, the link has been posted on the course page, and we might want to rename this to be 1.3 in this case. And now the students will be able to access and view this. By simply clicking on it, it will take them directly to the article. And there is a link, the actual PDF and such. Now to add a web page, you can also add web pages to your course here. And to do that, we go under Add an Activity or a Resource. Scroll down under the Resources here and choose Page then click on add and then we want to give a name to this resource now under description this is where you describe this activity you could choose to post that in the front page but the content of this web page will be here under this area content most individuals they type it up here on the top and then they get an error and such it's best to simply type all your components and such down in the content area. Now in here you can put all the content that you want for that particular item and such and then format it accordingly as well. So you can basically type anything that you want in here and also format this using the styles here any way that you want and also use any of those tools that you would prefer from this toolbar. So you can do the lists here, the unordered lists and such. You can hyperlink to other sites and resources by simply selecting the text and then clicking on the link icon here and then just put the link to that particular website and such. Or you could even a link to a document on your computer. So let's say you have a e-textbook or what, you can simply select the words here and then choose the link option and then browse and then choose the file that is your textbook. Let's assume that this is the textbook or the file that you want to have the students click on and open it and view it and such. And format this any way you want. Notice you also have here the accessibility checker. So for certain things, it's important that you make sure that there are no accessibility problems for those with disabilities. And then we click on Save and Return to the course. Now, when the student clicks on it, or you can go ahead and preview it, you can click on it. And this is what it will look like at this stage. And I'd suggest that we rename this.
In this session, I will demonstrate how to post links to YouTube videos and also how to embed videos from YouTube on a course page. So the first one will be using the URL option. So we'll first locate the video on YouTube. Let's say that this is our video on YouTube. You can copy either the URL up here on the address bar or you can click here on the share icon and then copy the URL from here. So either one will be just fine. So we copy the URL. We go back to our course page. We make sure editing is turned on in the course and then we click on add an activity. Scroll down to the URL option. Click on add. and then give it a name. Then under the external URL, this is where we'll paste by using Control V or however you paste, and then scroll down and then save and return to the course. At this point, notice the link to that video has been posted in the course page. We can rename it if we wanted to. And if we click on it, it will take us on a new tab here to that particular video on YouTube. What do you want to do with your life? Now, we can also embed the same video on an existing page and we can use the web page option and the web page option will be basically by clicking here on add a resource or activity and then scroll down and choose page here. But we also have already a web page here under item 1.4 and we could embed it in that particular page currently. So we click on edit settings here. And the process, by the way, for this is the same for any of the activities that we'll be doing later in this tutorial as well. So you're just going into the details of that activity under the, the content or description of that activity, and then you can embed that anywhere in your document. Now to embed it, we need to first go back to YouTube, and we go under the share option here, and then we want to go and choose the embed option here. Notice that the dimensions are going to be 560 by 315. That's going to be slightly smaller than what we see the preview here on the left. But we can change those dimensions if necessary. A typical one would be 640 by 360. That's another good size to use. Now in this case, we can select this and copy it. And then we can come back here to our page in eLearning. And then once we are in edit mode here for the content, we can't simply just paste it anywhere in here. We have to use this HTML code area, and we just have to simply paste it in there. So we click here under HTML first, and notice you have all these codes and such. So you can either paste the stuff that we copied from YouTube at the bottom of this document, or find the spot where you want it in the document here where it makes sense between those codes, and then paste it in there. Control V to paste it and such. Now, I know this is a little bit more advanced here, but for those of you that are adventurous, you can try this. Then you click here on HTML uh, button again, and notice that has now been embedded as part of our page. So this will be streamed from YouTube, but it's part of the page here in eLearning. Now, if we press here, save and return to the course, that will take us back to the main course. And then if we want to preview it, we can click here on item 1.4 because 1.5 was a direct URL to the YouTube, but item 1.4 was the embedded video. So notice here we have some content, we have the video, and then we have also additional content that we had earlier for that web page. Again, this works exactly the same way for assignments, and other activities in the course. If you have been watching the previous sessions in this tutorial, 
you'll realize that so far we have been posting resources for the students, but nothing is gradable at this point yet. We also configured the gradebook so that the course is ready and good to go in that area. Now we're going to learn how to configure assignments in your course. One of the most common types of assignments is the case where a student has to type a paper and submit it for grading and you'll provide feedback grading it. So we'll go here under Add an Activity and then we're going to choose the option for Assignment. Next we're going to go down here under Add and then we need to give a title to this assignment. So you'll give it a title and then you're going to use the description area where you'll post the various requirements for this paper. Now you can copy those requirements from the syllabus or from some kind of document that you might have with the requirements and such. In this case I'm just going to paste a bunch of stuff here. It's best to also post the rubric either as part of this document right here or you can post it as a file attachment right below in this area by either browsing for the file and finding and locating it or by dragging and dropping the file. So let's say this is my assignment one details as well. I can simply drag and drop it in here and that was by having this explorer window right above the e-learning page and holding down the mouse and dragging it over to this box. The next thing here is the availability for this assignment. So the availability is when are students allowed to start submitting to this assignment. So you can uncheck the starting point if you want or you can set those but remember any of those dates need to be accurate. There's nothing more frustrating to the students than inaccurate dates. Remember that the due dates and such they also show up on the dashboard of the students and also in their calendar. So it's very important that those are kept up to date and such. So you're going to pick when the assignment is due and the time and the cutoff date if you enable that that will basically not allow the students to submit it after the deadline for the assignment. My suggestion is that you don't set cutoff dates unless you're going to be really be strict and never accept any papers from your students when they are late and such because they'll always have an excuse where they want to resubmit it and you're going to make an exception and if you have a cutoff date then there's no mechanism for them to upload it at least easily then remind me to grade you can specify when you want to be reminded to grade it and such then you have the file submission types. This is where you can specify what are the students going to submit to you. So this online text, that means it's going to be a little box for the students to type their response for this paper. So you could use that for very simple types of assignments and such, but in most cases you want them to type it in Microsoft Word or some kind of word processor and then submit it electronically. Now for most assignments I also suggest that you keep here the online text option. In some cases students will type their paper in Google Docs and they need a mechanism to post the link to that assignment. So the online text will actually help with uh, giving them that flexibility to post the link to the Google Doc and such. Then further down here some of those other settings you don't need to set the types of accepted files and such you can leave those alone and then under the submission settings you don't need to customize those but uh, if you prefer to you can feedback types I would suggest that you leave those in place and not change those I'll cover those shortly the submission types if you want group work and such, that uh, can be defined in here for this specific assignment. However, remember, it, in order to use the group option, you have to have defined the groups in a course, and that's a different tutorial for a different time. Under Submission Settings and Notifications, here is where 
you can set a notification. So the default here is that you'll be notified only about late submissions. So somebody submitted it on Wednesday when they were supposed to submit it on Tuesday, you'll get an email notification for that. I'll suggest that you keep that on and then also notify graders about submissions. That's an option where you'd be getting an email every time a student submits a paper and probably that'll be too much email. So leave that as no as stated there. Then under grade, here is where we can specify how we are going to grade this activity. In this case, we are going to grade it by using points and the points are going to be the maximum number of those points is going to be 100. Now, my suggestion would be that if it's small reflection papers, one or two pages, maybe grade them against 20 points or 30 points. But if it's a research paper, then grade it against 100 points. The higher the number of points, the more flexibility, obviously, you have in grading that particular assignment. There are also mechanisms here to use additional scales, but for the sake of simplicity, we are going to stick to the points for now. Then there are additional grading methods where you can use direct grading, and that's basically you looking at the paper and you're going to make up your mind that this is what grade the student deserves for that paper and such. Then there are also options here to use a rubric and other methods as well, which we'll cover them in a different tutorial. So for most papers, you'll use simple direct grading. And then under grade category, this is important. Since we configured the grade book earlier in this course, now we have the various categories that we defined in the grade book based on the syllabus. So that's why I'd recommend that you go back to that video to configure the grade book and how that is done to understand this better. But here we specify that that's assignment one it belongs under research projects, let's assume. And then we scroll down here, leave everything else alone. You could restrict access here for students based on conditions and such, but if you're starting with e-learning, I would not mess with the access restrictions and such. Then under activity completion, this means that the students can mark this activity as completed after the students have submitted something to it. So basically they have done their part of their job and now it's up to you to grade it. So basically for them, they have completed this activity. Then we click here under save and return to the course. And then here we have the paper. We can renumber it if we wanted to. And at this point, the students and you can click on it. And these are the details for it. This is what I had copied and pasted. This is that document, or it can be a rubric or additional documentation and such for the students and such. Now, the students on their end, they will have an upload button right down here. So here is the student view from their point of view. So they will be able to click on this assignment and read all the various directions and requirements here. And then right below, they'll have an option to upload the assignment. It will also tell them the time and date, how much longer they have to complete this paper. Of course, they will not have a year here. But they'll click on Upload Assignment. And then they'll scroll down again. They'll have to acknowledge that this is their own work. And then this is the online text option where they can post a link to their Google Doc if they're using Google Docs. Or down here, this is where they can upload the paper, submitting it to the system. So they'll do something similar to that. And then they'll press the Save Changes. And then they will see that they uploaded the file at this time and they can preview it and even edit it if necessary. So that's the student view on their end. And this is the faculty view here on our end. Now, my suggestion would also be that you can probably differentiate the various assignments here by adding a little label in the course page. So if we go here under Add an Activity and then scroll down under Label, you can click on Add.
and you can use one of the styles here if you want maybe that's slightly too large so you can use the small heading and then press save and return to the course now the other thing that you can do here is you can move these activities around so if I wanted to move this assignments option right above I can simply drag it up and now the word assignments and then I it will be listing my assignments here as well notice you can also hide a specific assignment if you don't want to show various activities in the course to the students or your lecture notes or whatever until the class is over you can hide specific activities within the unit and then to show it you click on edit settings again choose show and then that will be visible again if you want to hide the whole unit you can simply click on edit choose hide topic and that hides all the activities from the students and then you can show it by clicking on edit and choose show topic and of course this was a little extra for the assignments for configuring assignments in e-learning but an extra tip here with how you hide activities and how you show them as well one other thing in case i forget and such you can also duplicate activities by choosing the option here duplicate and it will make a copy of this specific activity with all the various settings and you can just change the content or requirements within the description for that activity if for some reason you had to modify something within this activity or this assignment just click on edit here choose edit settings and then make the modifications that you want from here and then make sure you save the changes and go back the other thing that you can do is click on the assignment click on the gear icon choose edit settings and that will take you to the same page to make the modifications so that's how you create an assignment and how you customize it and such this probably will be the majority of the items that you'll be entering in the course page and in e-learning. And the next video will be on how to grade student work and provide feedback on student assignments. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade student assignments or student papers in e-learning. So earlier we configured an assignment and the students are going to complete it and then they are going to submit the paper electronically back to us. Now to grade this assignment, we can click here on the assignment itself and it will see the description and all the various requirements and such. And if we scroll further down, there's an option here for view all submissions. This will give us a listing of all the students in the course here, along with the submissions and the papers that they have submitted for us to grade. Now in this case, notice it tells us that the student has submitted it and the time when they submitted it, as well as the document that they posted as well. Now to grade it, we click here under grade And then the system is going to give us a preview of the document that they submitted of the assignment here on the left. And then on the right hand side, we'll have the link where we can download the original that they uploaded. Then we have the option here where to enter the grade and also the option to put in feedback comments and simply type our notes in here and such after we posted our grade. Notice there are a couple options here for recording audio feedback and even video feedback as well for grading the student paper. And further down, we have also here the feedback files that in case where we downloaded the student original paper and we wanted to use Microsoft Word for commenting and such, then we could upload that paper back to the student by dragging and dropping it in this area or browsing to add it from here. 
Now, to preview the student paper, in some cases you'll see the front page will have content in there, but if you don't see the front page, go to the next page and you'll be able to preview each page of that specific student paper. And this is one of the pages. Now, notice you have these tools here in the top, and this is inline grading. So you're basically grading and making comments in the document. Now, what happens is that every time the student submits it, even a Word document, the system is converting it into a PDF document behind the scenes and allowing you to make any of these modifications. So in this case, you can use any of these tools, the commenting tools. So basically, you're writing or dragging a little box here, or however big you want to make that box. And you can put in there Let's assume. And then notice that they become these little call out boxes all over the place. Additionally, you can use the pen tool here to circle items and make notes this way. So you're combining or moving from one to the other. And then you can just put in there a little comment. Notice you can also draw up various specific other boxes here as well and go through that paper this way. By the way, if you needed to delete one of those comments or one of those objects and such, you'd have to choose here the little arrow icon and then go and select that object. And then notice there's a little delete button in the bottom right. Some faculty have trouble deleting stuff, so that's how you do it, uh, to remove a component that you selected and such. Now, once you have graded the paper, you'd scroll down here on the right-hand side, and you'd say, OK, this will be 89 points. And you can put additional comments in here. Say, C. It is best to put constructive comments, of course. The students are trying to learn from their mistakes, and that's what would be beneficial for them. So sufficient and impactful feedback and helpful feedback would be beneficial in this case. And then once you have posted your comments, you can press Save Changes or Save and Show the Next Student. In the case where you're grading, the paper and you want to download those papers in Microsoft Word and such, you can simply click here on the link for the assignment. Once it's downloaded, then go into the Review tab and then add various comments in there as well. Then once you're done with this paper, you're going to save it where you can find it. And then to upload it back to the student, then you can go here under Feedback Files, and you can upload it by using the Add button and browsing for it. And then choosing Upload File. So in this case, the student will receive a graded paper with comments. But you don't need to do both these options. So you can either do the inline commenting here on the left, like we did earlier. Or you can do the Word option and then attaching the feedback file. Now that you posted the comments and such, you can navigate to the next student either from the drop down here or choose Save and Show the Next. And it'll show the next student. Or you can go back to the course, to the assignment here. And view all submissions. And then in this area, notice that the grade has been posted for this specific student. And then you can grade the next student's work. Now, in this case, due to the testing environment here, no others have submitted a paper and such. Now, 
if you have a long list of students and you graded papers uh, on regular paper and such, and you just want to enter the grades, there's an option here where you can enable right below the grade option to have a little box where you post the grades. And to enable that option, you have to go down here to the very bottom. So if you're go under the assignment, so here's the assignment details. You basically click on the assignment, you saw the details, you scroll down to view all submissions, and then if you scroll further down, you can choose and enable here quick grading. Quick grading will allow you to simply post the grades for the students in your course. Let's say he submitted on paper here and he got 87, and then this one got uh, 78, and this one got 23. Now you can choose to save. You have to save them, otherwise the system is not going to track them. So make sure anytime you're doing this, press Save Quick Grading Changes, and now those grades will be posted in the grade book. Notice you can also change how many assignments to show per page, so you can choose to show all of them. In that way you have a listing of all the students in the course listed in this page when you're viewing all the assignments. In some cases, you might also want to download, if you're using Microsoft Word for the comments and such, you might want to download all the papers for this assignment instead of doing them one by one. You can go here under Grading Action, and then you can choose to download all submissions. And that will create a zip file, and then you're going to extract them and work with each file individually. So that's a little bit more advanced and such. But this is the process for grading the assignments and such. Then if you go back to the course here, course home page, you can also go to the grade book and you'll notice that the grades at this point have been posted and trickling down from that specific assignment. So keep in mind when you do the grading, do it from the assignment itself and then they'll trickle down to the gradebook rather than coming and entering them directly on the gradebook from here because in this case you're overriding those grades. Also, another tip would be if a student has not submitted their work, give them a zero right there and that will be posted as zero in the gradebook and it will cause them to panic so that they will have to do the other assignments and such. Remember that by default, when a student does not have a grade for an assignment, they are not penalized in the system. So the best practice there is, even though there are some modifications you can make to count those as zeros, it's best to always assign a value to the student's work. And that's grading. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade papers using video or audio feedback. So let's suppose we have an assignment here. Let's say assignment one. We scroll down to, and we want to grade this paper. The paper will show up here on the left-hand side. You could make comments directly on the paper if you wanted by using this tool right here and point out specific areas or spelling or whatever it is that you want to point out. Now on the right hand side, once you have re reviewed the paper and such, on the right hand side here you can place the grade that they received in the paper and then here you type your comments and this was time consuming particularly if you were to give very detailed uh, feedback for your students. You can provide feedback either via audio or by using the video recorder. So in this case, if I want to record video for the student feedback, you just click on the video recording thing here. Now it may ask you to allow, there will be a prompt here on the top left, depending on what browser you're using, to allow the webcam to be utilized. So you need to click yes, of course, for that to take place. Then here, once you press start recording, that's when you can start giving your feedback for your students. And uh, at this point, you can just outline as to what the issues of the paper are and such. So you could say, uh, good um, a thesis statement. However, there were a couple areas that need improvement, uh, particularly in the specific steps 
for to improve in public speaking and such. So you just need to outline what they need to improve and uh, and such. When you're ready, you press stop, and then you, here you can uh, play this video. And uh, at this point, if you don't like it, you can re-record it again. And if you like it, you can simply uh, press attach recording. Once you're done with your, your video recording here, you can simply press save and show the next. If I go here as a student to this paper, they'll go to e-learning, they'll click on that specific assignment, and then they'll see what grade they got in it. And then down here, they're going to see the video feedback. All they have to do here is press play, and that video will be playing and, uh, for them. Now they can see the same feedback as well from grades. If they click on grades and they scroll down under that specific activity, they'll see what grade they got and also they can see the feedback video that you gave to them. So this is very powerful and very effective, particularly in online courses or any courses to kind of give that personal connection with the students and provide them sufficient feedback, but in less time. So you're grading more papers, providing more feedback, but in less time overall. Now, if you wanted to do the audio feedback only, you can go back to the assignment here and let's uh, go back to, let's say, the one that I graded earlier. I'm going to delete the video feedback and now I want to do audio feedback. You just click on audio here, plus start recording. And then you just provide the feedback with all the comments that you want to include for your student. When you're ready to stop the recording, just press stop recording. You'll get a preview here so you can play it. And if you want, don't like it, you can re record it. Then press attach recording. Then press submit changes. And then if we go and log in here as a student, the student will see this is from the grade book. They will see what grade they got, and also they'll have an audio recording that they, they can play from and then you the just grade book. The feedback. Now, if they also go under the course activity and go under that specific assignment, they'll be able to see what they submitted, the, what grade they got, and then also what the feedback they got from you from the instructor. They can also see the annotated PDF as well with your comments on it. And then since we are here using the recorder, this tool is also available for you to give directions for your students as to what they have to do or what the requirements for the paper are. So all you have to do in that case is click on edit settings and you can use this on any type of activity wherever you see this icon so you can simply if you want to insert a quick video here about this assignment you can simply press record video start recording and then just explain what the assignment is going to be about for example uh, create a five or write a five page research paper with three references and such and um, posted before the end of the unit. Then once you are done with it, you press attach recording and now the requirements here for this paper have been posted. So all you have to do is press save and display and then the students will be able to review the requirements for this assignment via video. Just explain what the assignment is going to be about. about.